What's up, people? Of course, my name is DJ Reg West. Welcome back to Wave Files. On this edition of Wave Files, I have a good friend of mine who's joining us today. He is an illustrious DJ who's definitely paid his dues to get to where he is today in the industry. You've seen him on the road. You've seen him on TV. You've definitely heard him on the radio. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce my guy, my friend, DJ Sus One. Sus, yeah. what up, boy? What up? Yeah, what's up? I, I love I, the I intro, feel- but let me add to it. You know yes. me. You know me way before that. <laughs> you yes. know what I'm saying? Yes. Way before TV, way before radio. I just wanted to, you know, I knew you were going to say the same way, but me and Reg go so far back. He knows me when we and him used to throw parties together and we were both fucking broke. Well, broke. <laughs> I was about to say, let me speak for myself, but I got, he just confirmed that he was broke too. And, um, and you know, we were hustling, man. We used to fucking put flyers out before Instagram on cars at clubs and stuff. So Reg knows me way before everything he just announced, but he's my Yo, brother. What's good, bro? I, I love you, dude. We, 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 we definitely, we definitely got that history. We, I, we, I could say we, we got our, we cut our teeth together. You know what I mean? Like we've, yeah, like you said, we, we put, we put flyers on cars together. <laughs> we, we threw parties in the snow together. Yeah, man, it's. Well, we we can talk about all that shit in in this in this in this in this uh, podcast. I hope we have the time to do that today. If not, definitely a part two in season two. But um, how are you, man? We're in the middle of COVID. I know as a DJ who lives in New York in the, in the NYC area, it's definitely been a challenge um, for DJs who have had it's their main income, you know, been taken away from them. How are you doing mentally and and spiritually during this time? I'm way better now. Um, at the beginning of this year, I'm gonna keep it real with you. I was stressed, depressed, um, because you know, as you can probably relate to our whole world stop, the club stopped yeah. because of the pandemic, because of COVID-19, the club stopped, the concert stopped. Thank God um some of the radio gigs I had were still there because that was all I had left. But my whole world stopped. So, you know, it was very stressful and I was very sad at the beginning. Then Instagram Live really became a big thing, and it was like um, medicine for me and being able to play things I don't normally be normally playing the clubs or on the radio and doing it every day, um, and that helped my my spirit and my mind. But it didn't help money wise. But then you know, as months passed, I got I got I was able to figure things out. I was able to figure out how to make money online because I was doing the Instagram Lives and shot the D nice because he shouted me during that time when he became even more famous from. From his lives on the Instagram, he shouted Super me, and then I got famous D Nights right now. Yes, <laughs> he shouted me, and people started following me and going on my lives, and I created um, energy there, and I was able to make money virally. You know what I'm saying? And then I um, or virtually, and I was um, I should say virtually, not virally, virtually, and I was able to make money from the crib. I had to you know reevaluate my whole entire career in life, but you know, as hustlers, that's what we do. Red, you a hustler. When Damn shit right. goes left, even if the world goes left, like you know what I'm saying, whether it be your fault or not your fault, you got we gotta we have to figure it out. We could be depressed for a while, but then you gotta toughen up and figure this shit out. Right. Because even I don't think everybody quite understands like being a DJ, you are a business. You know what I'm saying? You might not be a brick and mortar, but you're a business. So if if you own a brick and mortar spot and you sell, I don't know, ham sandwiches, but nobody on the block wants ham sandwiches anymore, what you gonna do? You gonna make cheese sandwiches, right? So you gotta you exactly. gotta figure out like like your next move. And I think as DJs, I've and I don't know about you, but I have some of I noticed some of our peers just kind of disappeared from social media. Like they don't they haven't posted since March of 2020. Like they haven't done anything. And I, I, I to be honest, I've I was nervous with some of them. Like I reached out, some of them have hit me back. Others MIA. It is. It was definitely a point of like, yo, what are we doing right now? You know what I mean? So I, I'm I'm glad you're in a in a better mental space right now because like like I just said, some of us are just still wobbly, you know what I mean? Um Yeah, and I'm still let's not get twisted. I'm still trying to figure a lot of things out because I'm still missing a lot of money that I was making, but I was able to secure the Wendy right? Williams show over the um thank God. Um you know, I was able to get a deal with Remy Martin over the pandemic. Certain things that were unexpected came. And I think it was for me just hustling and doing the lives and from things I did prior to the pandemic and stuff. So thank God, man, because a lot of people that I know and that you know, yeah, they're still struggling and trying to figure it out. Times is crazy right now. Times are very crazy. But So since since you mentioned Wendy, let's let's start with the most recent stuff. And I guess we can walk our way backwards. Um, 
yes, you have been, I, I can say for, I'm, I'm happy for you that, that you got the Wendy Williams gig. You are on television five days a week with the Wendy Williams show as the official Wendy Williams DJ. Now um, you have money in your pocket. It's not, obviously the clubs are closed. So it's definitely a blessing to have something moving that's tangible regularly. Um, how is that environment for you? How was it being, how was it DJing for maybe like, you know, a third of a crowd and how's the energy with Wendy and, and the audience and, and, and where you are right now with, with them? I love being able to work when times is hard to get work right now. So let's just say that uh, no, I love doing, I love being on TV. That's new for me. Like, you know, you've seen me do little TV, like where I was on love and hip hop for 1.2 seconds or some dumb shit like that. Right. Or I, or I was, on, um, you know, the basement guest DJing back in the day or 106. Oh, yeah, those are some fun days, dog. Jesus. Yeah, those were the days, those were the days. But I never had consistent television. This is really my first consistent television. Um, gig so i i enjoy it i think i was able to do wendy before the pandemic i guess dj'd a couple of times right and i i know the difference from being the crowd and djing for the crowd and that energy from what it is now because right now they just have the staffers so that's very different because you don't have that high energy people just happy to be there partying in the morning super excited energy um but it's still fun man i, I love the staff um i want to say thank you to wendy williams for giving me the opportunity and I love it, man. I just, that's, if I, if I had any complaint, because I have none, if I had any complaint, I would say, I just can't wait for things to go back to normal so that we can have the general public come and we could have a real audience. I got you. Cause, cause playing for a, a, I guess a crowd that is, has to be there is different than, you know, your live audience. So I guess we was speaking yeah. of that. You know, speaking of that, I guess we can we can dive into radio because that's kind of what radio is in, in a sense, right? Like you're playing in a room with maybe two other people in it, so it's difficult to gauge energy. Um, yeah, but on, on radio, you're right. You're absolutely right. But the thing is, the difference is on radio, you'll get um, I'll get people tagging me on Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Yo, that's Sus true. is killing it, that's or true. people or people will text me like you've texted me a couple of times, like. I think you texted me the other day. I'm I'm speeding down the highway. You're on like so you Yo, get that. Yeah, at least right. I know, I get that energy. Like like people are listening. Like you know what I'm saying. Even if it's five people or two people that hit me, I'm like, all right, somebody's somebody's rocking out with me. You know what I'm saying? So no, you're right. You're right. You're one thousand percent right. That's that's the that's the advantage of of I guess having social media and being live in the mix. You get that in instant gratification from people rocking with you I, yeah you're right you're right yeah. you're right I I, I I i give you that i just thought i just think about when you started in radio and it was just like you're looking at a at a wall you know what i'm saying and and you're just mixing and only the only time you get a reaction is when someone calls on, on the hotline oh my god such you're killing it you know what i mean versus <laughs> versus versus now when you get the instant and I was going to say, it's so funny, and you know this, and we're speaking to the people who might not know, because when you're listening from the car or from your crib or wherever you listen to the radio, people, it, the, 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 it, it just seems like it's a big party. Like when you're listening, the perception is there's a big party going on over there. There's a big party. There's a million people over there. But Reg, you've visited me at the radio station tons of times, and sometimes it'd just be me and you or me, you, and another person. You know, you know what I'm saying? So Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it'd, be, it'd be the it's, it's either you and the engineer, or it's me, you, and the engineer, and you and they're like, all right, how am I going to kill the people now? And you have to like really get your energy up, and it's it's definitely a, a different, I guess it's a it's a diff it's a different pocket of DJing. Like I, I tell people all the time, they ask me like, yo, how did you get where did you get to, and how did you do this, and how did you do that? Everything is an individual, I guess, talent, right? Because DJing on TV is way different than DJing on the radio and DJing in the club is way different than DJing on tour. They're all different talents. So but, but before you before you dive into, into into that part of it, can you can you talk about how you started in radio and how you got to Power 105 and the slot that you're in right now or slots that you're in right now? It was such a journey to get on radio, man. I don't even know if we got time to say the whole story, but I'll say the Give me the Short cliff version, notes. Like, yeah, give me the cliff notes. Yeah, so I hustled my way through the mixtapes, the mixtape era, hustled my way to get into the clubs. Um, and that's a whole big story in itself, but I'm well, just I, 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 if we get the time to talk about that today, we will. If not, we'll leave it for season two. 
But go ahead, brother. There used to be this club called Nine and a Half slash Tens that was in New York City. And this dude named DJ Playtime, shout out to Playtime from Hartford, Connecticut. He um, was there and he told me, yo, you know, I was rocking. And he told me, yo, they're hiring DJs at our station up in Hartford, Connecticut, Power 1041. It's the sister station to Power 1051. And I couldn't get on radio in New York for whatever reason. I just could, I wasn't getting them the opportunity. So he said, why don't you come fill in for me at this club called Bar With No Name in Hartford, Connecticut? The program director is going to be there. And if you kill it, you know what I'm saying? Um, they'll give you probably give you a shot on the radio because he had to leave town. So shout to DJ Playtime. I, fill, I filled in for him at Bar With No Name. And I did my thing, you know, we do, this is what we do. We DJ the clubs. We've been doing it for years. Yes. So I, so I guess they liked me and they gave me an opportunity. They tried me out on air on, on power 1041 in Hartford, Connecticut. Then they tried me again on power 1041 in Hartford, Connecticut. And then they, I ended up getting the job. I had to drive. Now, let me tell you guys, man, I was broke. What a, I don't even remember what year neon that was with different colored doors um, and all sorts of craziness. And I used to drive from my crib that was in Yonkers slash Hastings on Hudson two and a half hours to Connecticut and two and a half hours back every day in a hoopty, not knowing where I'm going to get gas money from just to do an hour of radio. Right. It started off one day a week. Then they gave me six days a week. And I think if I'm not mistaken, it was only one hour a day except for Fridays. It was four hours. And I just hustled my ass off. That's how I got on radio. That was my first opportunity on radio. That's how I got on radio. And then I was just hustling my ass off. I started doing clubs in Connecticut, started doing all that. And it got to a point where I couldn't do it no more. I was so broke. Like there was times I had to ask the program director. These are stories I never told. I used to ask the program director, this guy named Michael McGuire. Mm. I'm shout to Michael McGuire because he gave me my first opportunity on radio. I used to ask him for money out of his, he like asked him for money for gas and, and tolls and stuff. He gave me money out of his pocket because they, I forgot what the hourly rate was up there. It was like $7 an hour or $6 an hour. And I was only on for an hour. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was some crazy shit like that. So he used to give me money out of his pocket, but it got to the point where I couldn't handle it no more. My car was broken down all the time. Um, I was six months behind on rent. Um, I just couldn't do no. So I asked him if I could go back to doing one day a week. And at the time I felt the way about this because I basically got fired. They took me off the schedule. Now that I'm older, I understand that a corporation doesn't care about your personal problems. You knew what this was because that was his thing. You knew what this was. You knew what came with it. You need to be here. So um, but so they took me off the schedule for saying that. But that same day. Um. Power 105 called me and said, do you want to do Mixed Master Weekends? And I forgot to add that while I was doing Connecticut radio, I was calling Power. Laura Styles from Hot 97 used to work at Power 105 one at the time. I used to be calling her. How do I get on Power? How do I do it? Um, Carl Blaze, God rest his soul, used to be on Power 105. I used to hit him. Hey, yo, how can I get on Power? How can I get on Power? I used to harass and call like I wanted to get on Power. DJ Cut, shout out to DJ Cut. I used to ask him. And finally, I got the day I got fired, I remember the same day. They said, yo, we're having a Mix Master Weekend, you know, and, you know, you want to do it, we can have you on Mix Master Weekend. And um, that's how I got my foot in the door in New York. I was, I didn't get a full show or anything yet, but that's how I got my foot in the door. And around that same time, also, shout to DJ Clue. Um, Clue put me on tour with Mariah. This is how my relationship with Mariah Carey started, too. Yeah, I interned for Mariah Carey's label as a kid in the late 90s, like 98, 99. She had a label called Crave Records under Sony Music at the time, but she doesn't remember me from back then. My official time where I met Mariah and she remembers me is because DJ Clue, my brother, put me on tour with her because he had just left Hot 97 to come to Power 105.1. Now, if anybody knows the history of Radio New York, Clue used to be on Monday night mixtapes, um, only on Monday nights at Hot 97. He left that to do the show that he still has today, five days a week. On Power 1051. So he couldn't go on the full tour of Mariah Carey. So he took my young broke ass, but we were cool. And I was up <laughs> under his brand. He took my broke young ass and said, um, Yo, you want to go on tour with Mariah, basically? And of course, I'm like, Fuck yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I did like 90, 95% of the tour. And he just did the big cities of that, the ones that he had time to do. And um, he handled the contract and all that. And that's my, that's how my relationship started with Mariah Carey. And 
I ended up becoming her official DJ because I, I ended up doing a great job on the tour. Um, at least that's how they felt. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So and, hold on. Um, Hold on, hold on. Sorry. You, you, you now you are good. You you you're, you're jumping a little bit for me because I because I want to dive a little bit more in, in, into the radio career. So and and, and well, I want to get back. To, go, ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that was about to say because this is all around the same time, and it just reminded me of that. But around that same time, that's when I got you know the, I told you when I got fired the same day I got offered the um that mix show weekend on Power. Yeah. But it was around the same time that Clue put me for Mariah, and then I started doing more mix master weekends. They call it mix master weekends. And then um, shout hold to on Nadine. Second. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Explain to people what Mixed Master Weekends are because I don't think everybody understands that. They're, they're weekends that happen during holidays, right? So it's like like July 4th from Friday to, to Sunday, you having DJs play all day, right? That's, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot, not every market does it, but in New York, they have a history of doing it where they either get the DJs that's already working on the station or they get guest DJs to take over holiday weekends and make it like the DJs take over and it's just pure mixes all weekend, not just right. regular rotation music. So, so, so do you that feel, particular so I'm sorry. So you feel at the time you stood out so much that you were starting to get more noticed by, by the people at the station? No, well, I don't want to say stood out so much. I stood out a little bit, but I also was calling, begging them. Wow, I need an opportunity. I need an opportunity. I need an opportunity. <laughs> people, people heard me, um, on radio in Connecticut because Connecticut is so close to New York. So sometimes when people drive close to Connecticut or in Connecticut or drive or in a oh, New York that's Long close to Connecticut, they can Island. hear me on the radio. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There was Long Island. You could hear me in Long Island. I remember people used to say they tuned in in the Hamptons and shit. I'm like, how? Yep. I had to look on a map to see how that's even possible. Yeah. But, you're, um, you're six, you're six so miles away, no doggy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had, I had, a little bit of notoriety from being in the clubs and a little bit of notoriety because they knew I was on radio out there, but it wasn't like I was out here, like big name in these streets, like on some movie shit. I was calling like, yo, I was just hustling and calling and showing them what I'm doing on radio and telling them what I'm doing and blah, blah, blah. And finally they just gave me the opportunity. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Nadine Santos who um, works for music choice. But at the time she used to work for power one Oh five one. She was the assistant I think she was the music director or the assistant program director at the time. I think she was the assistant music direct, assistant program director at the time. She gave me the job. Shot the Helen Little, who works at iHeart. She's an on-air personality now, but she used to be the program director at the time. Um, she she hired me and um, shot the DJ Cut. Shot the Clue. Shot to everybody who co-signed me, you know, to be on Power. And I, and, you know, that was my end on Power. And then they finally ended up get um put me on afternoons to do a 20 minute mix called the mp3 playlist on steph lover's show <laughs> shout out to steph lover i used to shout be on to used to be on yeah. power 105 five days a week and that was my in to you know doing that oh before that before that they put me on five days a week we had this show called the list shout out to nadine santos once again and me and dj yanni was the djs on the list but we didn't even yanni, talk my guy yanni so. yes shout out to yanni so yeah, man, um, it's been a long. I like these stories because it's been a long journey. Now nah, it has been right. Like like we forget how long it's been, but it's been at least 10, 15 year journey to get where you are, just at power, right? Like it's it's been over ten years of you doing just doing mix show and then doing this and then doing that and getting into your space where you are a regular on the station where you know your mix show is top 20, top 50 in the country regularly. Am I correct? Yeah, but I'm still not, in my opinion, you know, it depends how you view it. In my opinion, I'm still not where I need to be. No, of course. The radio if if you, you, you have more goals and, 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 and more aspirations, of course, if yeah. you didn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't still love what you do. Right. But my, the, the exactly. point of me asking all, all that is that when I when I tune in, sometimes I don't hear you in your in your, sometimes in your normal slot. Sometimes I hear you filling up for Angie, which is the the drive home sp slot. Sometimes I hear you filling up for Pro Style, which is midday spot. And I I say that because it sounds like they trust you. And besides they, besides them trusting you, I know that you know how to run the boards. So you're the type of individual that you just aren't only the DJ, but you can run the show yourself. You're essentially and when i say run the boards ladies and gentlemen that means that he's able to produce the show as well as be the person you hear 
on the microphone and the, and the DJ. You have to, he's become a jack of all trades in the building, which be, makes him a commodity. So is, is that a reason why we hear you more so throughout the day, just not in your slot? Yeah, I think it's a big reason. Plus, plus you know, I've built a name in the city. Plus, I, I know how to do all the things that you said. Yeah, shout out to Cadillac Jack, who was the old program director of power, because he he put me in position to um, do overnights on Sundays. I forgot exactly how I started because I wasn't a jock. You're by yourself overnight on Sundays. <laughs> yeah, so I learned the boards because I, I was only a DJ. And I realized that the people in radio are more than just the DJ um, that are making money, the ones that are making the real money. So he before he left, they put and, and shot the G spin also. They put me in position to do late night. So it was be, basically, if I fuck up, you know, it's not like doing it prime time. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to run the boards. And yeah, now, now it became a thing where I can do, you can leave me in the radio station alone for the most part. And I could just be on the radio doing the DJing, doing the jocking and emceeing and doing the boards and doing the traffic and the weather and the commercials and all. <laughs> this, all that. Um, and plus I have a name in the city. So I just think, yeah, that's why I fill in a lot. Well, like like the like the manager of McDonald's, he got to know how to how to cook the fries, right? So that's 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 where you at right now, and I I, I think you're in a great place in 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 radio, and I I know you I know you want more, and it's it's just an opportunity just to grow from there. Um, let's talk. Oh, let's let me talk. say one more thing. Shout. Yeah, yeah. Let me say one more thing. Shout to Thea Mitchum, who's the program director there now, because she she continued me filling in for everybody because she could have said get this guy out the fuck out of here, but she continued it. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to her too um let's 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 take a step further back i, I want to talk about mariah but before we talk about mariah i want to talk about the clubs when the clubs were open um mm -hmm. you you for a long period of time before most of the of the cool clubs left the city um i could see you five days a week in the most illustrious uh, velvet ropey spots in the city. Um, can you talk about your yeah, journey yeah. To, 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 to get there? Because I, I remember, so I, I was never the, the big dude in the clubs. Like I would have my club or two, but I was the road guy. Like I was the guy always on the road. You were the guy that was, yo, sus is here. Yo, yo, sus is here. Yo, yo, sus is here. Can you talk about your yeah, journey yeah, yeah. To, to becoming that guy in the city? Because for a long period of time, when the clubs in Manhattan were popping, you were that guy. Can you talk about that journey? Yeah, that's a long ass journey too, bro. Like, <laughs> that's a let's, long ass story. Let me see if I can keep let's, it short. Let's, let's, start, let's, start at, let's start at Club Hollywood up up in Yonkers. Let's start. Let's start there. <laughs> My first, my first, that was a New Rochelle. My New first Rochelle, weekly me. club get. Before we even hit Club Hollywood, guys, I used to intern as a teenager in the late 90s, 98, 99, for record labels. I interned for Epic Records under Sony, Columbia Records under Sony. I interned for Cornerstone Promotion, which ended up turning to be the fader that you guys know this is the fader today. Um, I had a bunch of internships, right? In those internships, I ended up DJing for free, might I add, a, a lot of the industry parties and stuff like that. Um, on top of that, I used to <laughs> DJ. People used to hide me outside the industry and fucking not show up with the money. Like We all have these fucking stories. But I DJed all these uh, 10 crates of records, by the way, at the time, guys. Not what it is today. And, um, you know, I went to a school after interning. And those were my first experience with clubs. Then I went to a school that where I met Reg called Five Towns College, right? Um, DJed a couple of college parties there and stuff like that. Right after I got out of college, I didn't graduate, but I, I got when I stopped going to college, I ended up landing this gig in New Rochelle, which was my first weekly club gig ever, which Reg men mentioned was DJ. Um, I'm sorry, was Club Hollywood in New Rochelle. Shot the Sammy Z, who is the um, owner at the time. Um, shout out to my brother Tone Lopez, um, who I grew up with, and he put me on to Sammy Z. You know what I'm saying? And that was my first weekly gig. I was making, I think, $150 or $200, bro. Damn. Yo, and let me tell you, I, I remember. Yo, I didn't know he was making a buck 50, dog. Oh, shit. Bro, it was my first weekly gig. I had no name. Let me let me tell you, I was making two, not only, I was making $200 
every Saturday, right? But there was a dude, and I, I'm a young kid. I didn't know any better. I, there was a dude um, that was working in the owner's circle that's like, yo, I'm going to manage you, right? Mm-hmm. And then he's he wasn't doing anything except taking money out of the money I was getting. He was taking $50 every week. So <laughs> I I was only making $150 a week. Crazy. Yeah. But, I, but I created a name there, man. Club Hollywood, Super Ratchet, Super Hood. But was popping every week and had celebrities, you know. I, I ended up, and Sammy Z had money. He used to have the super on air commercials and on air lives. I remember this was my first experience DJing, and Miss Jones, when she was on High 97, was there, um, hosting a live. And I ended up DJing with Clue and K Slay one time. And I remember Cypher Sounds became one of the main DJs there, so I was DJing with him every week. And um, Camillo DJ there, I, you know, I started meeting a lot of people just DJing. Um, in Club Hollywood, and I, I got to understand what it is to rock a weekly club because I used to repeat my sets. You know that's horrible when you're a DJ. Yeah, but I, it was my my first weekly gig. I didn't know anybody. I just knew like this works. And it, it, that first that first weekly I, gig taught me to s- have to switch it up. You know what I'm saying? Yo, I, I I'm I, I'm, 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 still, I'm still I'm still guilty of that sometimes. When I get lazy, yo, fuck this. This shit work. This shit work. Let's go. Well, no, I have some go-to sets that I know in my mind, but you can't, I could, you know, when you're doing the same thing every week, because you have regulars, they're like, all right, this is what's coming next. So you got to switch it up when you're doing the regular shits. But um, yeah, after Club Hollywood, bro, I hustled my way into the city. You know, um, Derek Corley, who used to have the biggest parties in New York City, he had um, a company Corley. called Black Diamond. Black Diamond. Yeah, yeah, Black Diamond productions or promotions black diamond productions black diamond yep. and I, I didn't rock with him in his prime goldfinger rocked with him in his prime but i rocked with him when he still had a good movement and he you know i used to i used to go up to people and be like please give me a shot give me a shot i'll open up for the open up dj you know what i'm saying <laughs> so he gave me, he gave me a shot djing his clubs and i was rocking a lot of cool high end dope celebrity driven parties for um that he was throwing i also had a start getting a weekly uh, club envy in New York City, and I used to open up for Bobby mm. Trends. At- mm. And I used to shout to Nine Fingers, who was the promoter there. I used to tell him, just let me open up, let me open up for the opener, like whatever. And he gave me an opportunity there. Um, and then from there, I just started getting more opportunities. Derek was doing a lot of big parties, so I did like I don't know if you guys remember Club Pangea and Sessa and all, all these clubs in the city, you know what I'm saying? Um then I ended up doing a club. There's so many clubs. I'm giving you the super short version. So many clubs. Yeah, yeah. But I ended up doing a club called Cherry Lounge, which oh, Timbaland was a part owner. Uptown in Harlem. Yo, um, Clue was part owner. DJ Clue was a part owner. And he didn't give me the job. Derek Corley gave me the job. But Clue was part owner. Uh, I'm sure he had to approve it, though. Timbaland was a part owner. My guy Aton was a part owner. And there was a couple other um, people. And... That was a movie. Like, I remember the first night in Harlem, Diddy was there, brought out Bruce Willis. Like, it was crazy. Um, and that was my every Saturday gig for a while, too, in Harlem. And I built a name there. I remember, um, you know, Dipset used to come there and all the Harlem cats and rest in peace to Huddy Six and just a whole bunch of celebrities used to come there. So there's, there's endless clubs I used to DJ, man. It's been it was a long it was a long hustle and a long build. And then it just got to the point where people was like, yo, I need you. You, they would you see me at these clubs. Yo, I need you for my club. I need you for my club. I need you for my club. And then I switched up my style and ended up doing open format clubs. As you know, Reg, there was Club Stereo and 10 June and yep. all these clubs. And I used to go there and spin hip hop, rock, house, 80s, 90s, and just do open format. No, hold on. Um, let, me, let, me, let me pause you. Do, do you feel like that was, do you feel like AM was the person that made it cool for that to happen? Because I feel like during that during that point, like it was Serato, Serato was started becoming a thing, and DJs were being allowed to open up their their diversify their music a little bit more, right? Because at a point it was this is the hip hop club, that's the Spanish club, this is the pop music spot, nothing mixes. But at that point that you're mentioning, I feel DJ- like it was a transition. DJ AM made it famous and popular, but there was people doing it before him. Like I remember me and my brother DJ MOS, because we grew up together, Shout used to, to go to, I forgot the name of the club. Wasn't it? It was Club Lotus. We used to go to Club Lotus 
just to hang out and listen to DJ Reach, my brother DJ Reach Spin. Reach. And Reach was one of the first DJs. MOS told me to come check out this shit. And Reach was one of the first DJs before I heard DJ AM, before AM was famous, that I heard playing Joan Jett, I Love Rock and Roll. And you know, he was playing like rock records and old school shit that people were not playing um, before I heard AM doing it. You know what I'm saying? Now, Goldfinger what, used to what, do it too, but Goldfinger kept it pretty much like. Well, was what, 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 what was this still? Was the Serato era, or was this with the with the crates? Was this was this with the crates? Or no, that, the rock? That, you know what? I don't remember. It definitely wasn't Serato. I don't remember if CDs had started it yet. But I really feel like I want to say he was using vinyl. I really want to say he was using vinyl, but I, I have to confirm. Gotcha. It definitely wasn't Serato. It was either it was either vinyl or the CDs. But I really think it was the vinyl because because. It was amazing. Like uh, CDs, you still you could have burned anything, and I just remember the feeling like he has that. Like you know what I'm saying. So I really believe it was vinyl, and you know that made me like wow. And I wanted to do open format because there was a lot of records that you don't play don't in hip hop culture, but that right. I love. That mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's when I started going to the open format clubs. Um, I ended up coming back doing mainly hip hop, and to this day, I still don't know if it was a mistake or not. You know, I love hip hop, but. I stopped doing as many open format clubs because Power 105 One brought in a lot of new talent and they were trying to sell me like I was the bougie DJ. I didn't belong here. Um, mm. I'm not hip hop. Like, mm. And yeah, I'm not going to say no names, but that's what a lot of conversation was because I was doing the high end clubs that were more than hip hop. It was all types of music. Right. So I ended up coming back doing hip hop clubs. I didn't want to lose my radio gig and me and this dude named CEO bar um, bar was a promo was a promoter in New York city that was doing it for years. And he kept calling me through my brother K black for like a year and I just kept brushing it off. And then finally I called him cause I knew I had to start something dope and hot for hip hop. And he said, I finally said, let's do it. I'll get the talent to come through or whatever. And you handle everything else. Cause I don't know what the, how to throw a party like that in New York city. He ended up getting um, Pink Elephant on a Sunday. <laughs> mm -hmm. and I don't know if you I'm guys remember elephant. this. Anybody who's a club goer. He ended up locking in Pink Elephant on Sunday. I was the DJ and, his, and we were partners. He got the team of promoters. I used to get like the talent and stuff like that to come through and all that. And um, we created Pink Elephant on Sundays together. And it became the biggest hip hop night in New York City in that moment. Because there were so many clubs that was popping, but that became the biggest hip hop, high end, sexy club um, in that moment in New York City. And then, you know, M2 became a movie and a bunch of other clubs. M2. You know, so that's, and that's, I, I, I miss M2, dog. M2 was crazy, yo. Yo, bro, in M2, I remember a night where it was just, it was a light night. But I was DJing and Jay Z and his whole team was there, bro. Uh -huh. And I'm literally just DJing for Jay Z and the whole and all his people, and they're going crazy. It wasn't even popping in there like that. It was just a light night, and I was just DJing for whole. I got so many fucking stories, bro, man. Like yeah. we're gonna need another episode um, for season two to talk uh, to talk about like a lot of different stories. Yeah, because yeah. me and you have stories to go. Either of us was in this industry. That's a fact. That's a fact, yo. <laughs> <laughs> um, like um, people, I want to. We're not gonna be able to talk about this today. But we're not gonna be able to talk about this today, but people don't know the hustle. Like, like, bro, I used to sleep on the benches in Times Square. Uh, we'll talk about. We'll talk about it. Um, not Times Square. I'm sorry. In um, Penn Station. In, um, Penn State. what the fuck's the train station? Penn Station. No, not Penn Station. No, it's not Penn Station. Damn, I haven't taken a train in that long. <laughs> Grand Central? On 42nd Street. Grand, Grand Central. Central. I'm wilding. Yeah, I used to sleep on the benches there, bro, just because I used to be in the studio all night, not wanting to go home, meeting new people. And then one time we got out the studio, I had to be in the office for my internship like in an hour. So I used to just have soap and wash up in the sink and have a change of clothes like crazy but we'll, that's the, a whole for a whole nother episode it's the hustle dog i i, I think that's something that's very important that, that we uh, uh, discuss so that the younger generation can understand that 
it it's not given to you, dog. Like I just you know, speaking for myself, I remember back in the college days, and you probably remember this too. I had I had a job working at the record store. I worked for my pops in the morning. Mm-hmm. He had an order repair shop. So in the morning before before class in the morning, I would go open up my pops um order repair shop, sweep it up, make sure everything was 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 nice in there, come to class, then go to my, my job at the record store, then intern at a recording studio. And then DJ at night, and then come back the next day and do the shit all over again. So, bro, I can relate. I can relate. I, I get mad at some of the youth today, and no disrespect to them because you know they they're hustling in their own way. But absolutely, they have it so much easier than we had it. Like, they, I can't even believe people complaining when you have all this fucking social media. If I needed to reach somebody in Cali, I had to go to Cali, nigga, and I didn't have money to go to Cali. <laughs> but but here, but here's I the thing. Tag- <laughs> tag somebody like you know what I'm saying. If you want to talk to somebody, like Kelly, you have to either call them, and if they take your calls, you have to find them. Like but you know what I'm saying. But, but but here's the thing, though, right? Like you don't you 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 can't you can't relate to past experiences if you didn't live them. So that's the that's the situation. Exactly. We 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 don't know about the experiences of our of our parents previous, like of them having literally have to walk miles to get to where they got to get to because the bus ain't come. You know what I'm saying? Like it's 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 all relative, right? So. But again, like to your point, we like we can't just jump on Twitter and try to holler at you know Steve Stout. Like I have, like I have to literally wait outside his office and hope he sees me as he's leaving the, the job to go to dinner. Like that was that was the hustle, right? So yeah, but anyway, and he might and he might not talk to your ass. He might just walk past you. That's <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Right, 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 right. Or, 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 you know, if if you want to get a meeting at Def Jam, and, and back in the day, if Leo Cohen was coming out, you try to hand him a CD, but but security might, you know, hit you with a tackle. Is is this a different Yo, a different bro, time? I used to call record labels when I used to live with my pops as a kid, and call record labels like because remember, Reg, back in the day, it wasn't like today where you could just be on a DJ um, email blast or some stupid shit like that, or right. just buy the music or get a hard drive from somebody you had to get the vinyl from the record labels or you had to buy the vinyl from the stores so i wanted to get on them list to pick up vinyl from the record labels and i was i was just a kid living with my dad so i remember i used to call the rec every record label and tell them who i am and make up shit of what i'm doing and all (laughs) that yo so 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 what what he's talking about folks let me give you a little more more broader 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 picture back back in vinyl days um, if you didn't have the money to purchase vinyl, um, and you and you were like a like a, I say a level B C DJ, you could possibly get on the DJ list from the record label, and they would send you free vinyl promo vinyl, so you wouldn't have to spend your 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 DJ money on on records that. Wait, hold on, let me stop right there. You had to go. be a special DJ to send it to you. A yes. lot of the time, you had to come pick it up. And oh and yeah, let's the vinyl, vinyl Fridays. Let's we can't forget about vinyl, vinyl Fridays. Friday. Though. And the vinyl that they would give you is not necessarily whether you couldn't afford it or not, which I couldn't a lot, most of the time. But some of that vinyl was the ex- considered the Exclusive. exclusives because it was Exclusive. like from the record label. They wasn't even selling them in the stores just yet. Right. Right. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? You you had it. You had it. You had it two weeks, maybe a month prior to it being in the stores. You right. You right about that. You were right. You right. <laughs> oh my goodness, man. Um. I know, I know we showed on time today, but I, I wanna I wanna touch on a couple more topics before, before you gotta run to, to your to your 19 jobs. Um <laughs> let's let's talk let's 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 talk about Mariah specifically. Um you mentioned earlier that you linked up with Mariah through DJ Clue. Shout out to DJ Clue. Um Clue was just starting to get starting to sort of get his wings together with with the radio station at power, and you were afforded the opportunity to become Mariah's. I guess filling DJ the days Clue couldn't couldn't do it, but you and Mariah have built a bond over the years that you've become her official tour DJ. How was the experience? Yeah, I was, Go ahead. No, I was gonna say I wasn't a filling DJ. I did ninety percent of the tour, and he did the big cities. He basically put me on that tour. Um, but yeah, shout to Clue, man. Like even though I had met Mariah before that, she didn't know me. So because yeah, yeah, of yeah. Clues, the reason I really got to really. Get that relationship, is, Mariah. Is 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 that is that uh, outside of outside of being you know a, a great resume builder? How's that relationship with 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 you, Mariah, and how and has it helped you grow as a as a as a human being, as a as an entrepreneur, as a DJ? Because she's so seasoned 
in this business, I don't know how, what your relationship is like, but it, has she unintentionally given you gems about how to grow? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, probably unintentionally. We, you know, we've had conversations. Mariah is like my family now, bro. Like, you know, we started off as I was just DJing and she liked the way I DJ. Then we became friends. Then we became great friends. And now we're like family. Like, I, you know, I, I'm, I be in her crib. I haven't been there in a while, but because of the pandemic, but you know, I hang out with her and the kids and her boyfriend and her, her whole entire family and her, her staff and her everybody. Like, you know what I'm saying? And we, we've had tons of phone conversations over the years and like you this is how cool i am with mariah man when she used to be married to nick um years ago i remember she asked me to come over and um give her some music and i was there with her and nick and i met her kids in her stomach and put my hand on her stomach yo you know that <laughs> that's that's that's, really that's cool. very close <laughs> yeah that's a different type of cool mariah is my family like let's be clear and mariah doesn't even know it but she took me out of poverty um at the beginning like you know what i'm saying like when i was on that tour when i met her that was clues contract that wasn't mine he put me on that tour and then i built a relationship with her um but i didn't get the majority of that money like you know what i'm saying yeah but because of my relationship with her i ended up getting more gigs from her in the future and yo she's a real one man like i remember this billionaire wanted to hire dj am at the time um because he was popping and she said no you need to hire dj sus one <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? And this is when I'm young and this is early. And he hired me and gave me one of my biggest checks that I had ever got. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like she's she's Mariah be looking out, bro. Like shout out to shout out to Mariah. She's family. Um, I love her. I appreciate her. She does a lot that she ha doesn't have to do for me. Like even over the pandemic, she did an Instagram live with me. She didn't have to do that. She on live herself. She's she's the queen, she's one of the legends and queens. Like she didn't, but you know, she did it with me. And it was dope. So shout out to Mariah, man. Yo, that's that's love. It's I I think that that comes with you being a good dude, though. At the same time, right? Like over the years, like it, we, we have we have these conversations, and just just for everybody to know, I've known Sus. Damn, I've known you for twenty years, bro. Um, yeah, twenty years. Like man. we've 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 grown from you know experiences. I, I we'll talk about those in, in episode two, but like. I, I yeah. think it's 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 all about you garnering uh like your character, right? Like people don't want to be around people they don't like. So it's it's all about your energy and your vibe. And I think that's what you know gravitates you to 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 more opportunities. And, and all, not not only that, you mentioned it a few times in this interview already. You're very persistent. And I know this personally. You're a persistent individual. Yeah. If if you want to do something, you're gonna figure out how to do it. And is that does that come from your upbringing? Do, 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 was that instilled in you as a kid? Were you taught that, or is that something you just picked up over time, like just watching the game? Because I know you're an avid chess player. So is that something that you just like? Nah, I need to be persistent in anything I want to do. Like I, I see your, I see your board behind you. So I know you like you plan out situations. Like, can you talk about <laughs> that? Yeah, yeah. Um... I don't know where I got that from, bro. I don't want to say it's the way I was raised. I think, my, you know, my dad raised me to be a provider and work hard. You know what I'm saying? But my dad, if it was up to him at the beginning, he would have wanted me to be like a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. You know of what course. I'm saying? Of course. That's um, what all parents as far want, right? as he, Yeah, yeah. He didn't, now he's proud of me, but at the time he didn't see it. But the persistent part of it, I think that was just, just a part of my character because I, I can't really pinpoint something that taught me to be persistent. I just always went for something I wanted by nature. I don't know I don't know where that came from to be honest with you. It's just that's mm. just who I am. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like I I I know we only live one life. I know we all are destined to die. Hopefully we die at 100 years old and not at 50 or 40 or 30. Um but I know we we're only here for a short period of time and I have some dreams and goals and I want to conquer them and I know, I know shit's not given to you. Like it's not given to you. So, you know, I just, that's just always been part of my character. You know what I mean? Well, and you're the same way, bro. Like I remember when we met, like when we were throwing these parties in, in, um, in school and college, like we just went and did it. We didn't, 
Where did you get that from? Like, did somebody teach you to be persistent, like, or to to go after what you want? I think it was just a part of your character. Yeah, I I mean, for for me personally, like, like my pops is a, is his own entrepreneur, so like I I and my brothers are too. Like, they all are their own entrepreneurs. So it's like, if you want if you want cake, go get some cake. You know what I'm saying? Like, this this ain't nobody gonna ain't nobody gonna stop yeah. you. Figure it out. So that's that's what that's me. You know what I mean? Like, but because I had that visually in front of me, like I was, I wasn't taught it. I just watched the game and was like, "Oh, that's how that's supposed to happen." Okay, then I'm gonna do the same thing. Um, man. Um, so I, I know you got a roll, bro. Like, I'm, I'm watching the clock, and I don't want, I don't want to yeah, hold yeah, you gotta, too, 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 too long. But, um, I promise you, we're gonna do episode two. Listen, like we, yeah, we got about. We, we we got about thirty other things to talk about. We haven't talked about the feature presentation and your and your movie goals. We haven't talked about our five towns days. There's so many things that we can still discuss with my man DJ Sussman. He is a entrepreneur out here in these streets. Follow him on the gram at DJ Sussman. You catch him on the radio every damn day, probably because he's filling it for somebody on top of his own regular schedule. He's in multiple markets. It's my guy oh, DJ Sussman. Yo. Oh yeah, you, well, you just said I'm in multiple markets. I'm on Power 105.1 in New York. I'm on Jamming in Boston. I'm on Live 97.5 in Maryland. I'm on Taste the Taste Channel on Dash Radio. Catch me on the Wendy Williams Show uh, Monday through Friday. You gotta look at your local listings to see what channel is in your area. And um, yeah, well, we're gonna talk more. Man, Reg is my Reg is my brother. We've known each other for a long time. Um, I have to cut it short because I gotta go handle some some business. But we're gonna have a super long episode one. I mean episode two. So absolutely, ladies and gentlemen, this is my brother DJ Sus One, and we'll see you on the next one. All right. Yeah. <laughs>